You're listening to the Inside the Mix podcast with your host, Mark Matthews. Hey folks, and welcome back to the Inside the Mix podcast. As always, new listeners, you are very much welcome. Make sure you hit that follow button on your podcast player of choice and also subscribe and notify as well on YouTube so you get notified when there's a new episode. And as always, if you're a returning listener, a huge, huge welcome back. Now in this episode, I'm very excited today to welcome a returning guest. My friend, VYLT, Viola, a Singapore horror synth, dark synth, synth metal music producer, music <laughs> producer rather, with a love for witchy and occult vibes for a producer kickstart strategy. And we were talking off air that we did this approximately a year ago. We did one. So it was amazing. And it's almost three days off one year since we last spoke on the podcast. Time really does fly. Violet, how are you today? How are you? Hi, hi. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, I'm doing great. I'm, I'm just I'm just pumped to be back on the podcast. It's really been like a whole year and it's kind of crazy to think about that. I know, it's mad, isn't it? And I've been following your your your, your stuff online as well, as well. And obviously you've had really, really good success with your music and the streams. Oh, I know you. it's the one track, Vibrancy in particular, which got in excess of a 100,000 plays and and the live shows as well are really, really exciting. <laughs> yeah, thanks in part to you, by the way. I should mention, because um, for those who don't know, uh, Mark here did the mastering for my track, Vibrancy, which is ama- an amazing job. Thank you very much. Thank you for the <laughs> shout out. Um, it's, a, it's a great track. It really is. And um, it's, it's, it's always nice to see good music getting the exposure and the streams that it deserves. So... Yeah, very much deserved. So, and it's also really cool. We were once again talking off air of how I'm finding that I'm talking to individuals who are finding the podcast, and then they're finding you as an artist as well. And we was we were discussing one chap in particular, and how he listened to episode seventy five. So, audience, if you want to listen to the first episode, it's episode seventy five: how to mix bass frequencies. And he found uh, Violet V O I L T. Um, through that episode and a Spotify playlist. So it just goes to show that um, it's quite nice that. You coming on the podcast, you're then reaching that audience as well, that sort of evergreen content, which is really, really cool. Yeah, honestly, thanks because of Inside the Mix, I guess. So thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> you're very much welcome. And also, I th- it does help that your music is really, really good as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it's been a year. So we got you back on today for a producer kickstart session. And in the notes that you sent over to me, you mentioned about mixing low end, which I think is one of those ones for uh, for artists and uh, music producers. It's that ever. It's probably one of the most common pain points that I see in particular. But you mentioned about mixing guitars in general is quite tricky. So I've got some some tips here that I'm going to share with you today on mixing guitars, in particular with compression and EQ. But can you just go through at the moment? So Let's say you're you're mixing, or rather you yeah, let's say you're mixing or producing a, a song right now. What's the general sort of guitar setup that you use? Are you using more than one guitar and are you using VSTs or are you recording guitar through a cab? Um what what is your current process? Oh gosh. Um so I've changed my process a lot. Like every song is basically a completely different process. Um because I'm constantly trying to search for like the tone that I'm happy with. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I, I, I don't come from a band background, so I don't have that much experience with tone setting for guitars and stuff. I came from a primarily an electronic music background. So mm. like, um, let me think, I believe for visions, um, I use a, I recorded directly out from my amplifier. So I, I use a, a boss Katana Mark, Mark two, I believe is what it's called. Mm-hmm. So I just like I play the amplifier out loud straight into a con- condenser mic, and um, I just record the audio that way, and I run run it through like a little bit of pedal stuff, but not that much, like a noise and yeah. a um, a distortion just for like slight boost before going into the amplifier. Yeah, that was for visions. Um, for my latest, tr- I I have a track coming soon. It's a remix of a friend's track. Um, for that one, I actually opted to direct my input straight into my audio interface and then use a guitar sim. I was going to mention then about DIing the guitar. So one of my first points was going to be sort of like, could you DI the guitar and record it from the amp as well at the same time? But it sounds like you're doing 
it one way or the other. I think that's always quite a good thing to do is capture the DI signal, in particular with bass, oh. I find. I know bassists do that a lot. Um, and when I've been in the studio with our bass guitarist, and when I recorded bass for some songs of my own last year, we DI'd the bass. And then we also had, um, we were recording the bass for a bass cab as well. But that's always something to bear in mind. If you've, if you've got the facility to do it, I would recommend do it. It's the, just to capture the clean signal of the guitar as well, if you can do it. If you can get like a splitter going from your guitar, well, obviously one would go into your cab and then one you've got the DI going straight into your... It's been a while since I've done it, so I might be absolutely butchering that description. But, but basically, you want to capture the DI of the guitar into your audio interface and then obviously you can record it going out through your cab as well so i always think that's a really good tip is to record both that way you've got that clean signal and then you can if you're not happy with the guitar tone that you've captured going through the cab you can do what you've done in your second track which is to then just use that clean di and then use an amp sim it's just give you extra possibilities if that makes sense that is fascinating because i've never thought of that as an option <laughs> Mm. It's, it is fairly simple. It's really easy to do. You just need to get a splitter. Yeah, right. and they're quite. Okay. I'm thinking off the top of my head now. It's been a while since I've done it, but yeah, that that that's just a random thought that just came into my head. Then when when you were talking, but I think in terms of tips with regards to mixing guitar, so you say you know you're not really happy with the tone. I think when I when I was playing guitar, I was constantly tweaking the tone of my guitar. I never. I don't think it ever particularly stayed in one particular setting on my amp um, so I don't think you're alone in that respect but with regards to actual mixing so in your in the notes I've got here you mentioned about that you have a problem figure out how to mix the lows together with losing without losing punch in the guitars I think if you just get the the fundamentals of mixing down I think that would just come anyway with regards to the, the not with regards to not losing the guitars in the mix so, for example, if you're looking at EQ, when you're EQing a guitar, how do you start that particular process? Are you EQing and removing unnecessary frequencies, then compressing and then EQing again? How does that look in your mix at the moment? Oh, it's, it's hella messy. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I think the number one thing I immediately start off is I just like cut out the low, mm -hmm. like uh, below, like. Uh, okay, I don't remember the exact number, like maybe 150 or 200 and everything below that. I just take it out. Um, and then I tend to approach EQ from a very, like, not standardized way. <laughs> right, Where okay. sometimes, sometimes I try, like, scooping out mids a little bit to see how that sounds. And sometimes I actually boost mids to see how that sounds in the a whole mix itself. Um and then after that, I don't really use a compressor because, like, for me, I run my guitar, when I DI at least, I run it through a distortion pedal. And then I think I ran it through a compression pedal. Um, or, and, and then it went DI. So, like, it was a very, like, compressed signal already. It right. was, like, zero, zero, zero dynamics. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I get what you're saying now. So... I think you're doing the right thing with the EQ in rolling off the low end. My, I always say this to people as well. When you're doing that, obviously, you want to do it in the context of the mix and also make sure you're not using too steep a slope as well. I've seen some mixes um, and heard sort of reports of where the slopes, the slopes rather, sort of like 24 dB. I think if you, you want to have like a nice gradual slope of something like 6 dB, like a first order slope, because what can happen is if it's too steep, you can get sort of resonant bumps around that cutoff point. And obviously, the more of those you have, then it's going to ha introduce anomalies into your track. So I would be wary of that. And the other one as well is the other side. So you've, you, you can think of it like a band pass. So you've got your high pass filter. Are you doing anything in terms of low passing, sort of, let's say, around sort of eight, the eight kilohertz range? Are you doing anything around there? Uh, not at all. <laughs> Um, I usually like I, I reduce the shelf maybe if I find that the highs are too like scre screeching and things like that. Um, but usually I let the highs sit. Um, I, I think, yeah, because like m for my music, I have a lot of things going on in like the lows and the mids. So I try to find space in the higher high mid area for the guitar to sit. So that usually leads me to just let the sh highs just kind of shrill out. I, don't know I see what that's... you're saying. Yeah, it does make sense. And I think when you're looking at sort of like five to eight kilohertz, that's your sort of 
that's the range where your guitars are going to cut through the mix. And then below that, in the mid range, you've got the sort of presence frequencies, sort of like Ooh. one to five kilohertz. But right. I had this, I had a conversation with a mastering engineer the other day, and they mentioned a very valid point, which it might be quite a sweeping statement, which was whereby when you're recording a uh, through a cab, there is a natural band pass filter going on there. Yes. You're not, it's not producing frequencies higher than than sort of like 10 12k um that an amp sim would produce so i saw a really good tutorial online a few years back where this guy mentioned it and he's like yeah basically just band pass obviously you want to do it in the context of the mix again but you'll get a much more natural sounding guitar sound i don't know if that's ever something you've ever considered yeah no now that you mention it i think actually i think i you're i think i did and put a, a low pass filter for the di guitar i didn't do it for the cab sim guitar so that actually um lines up exactly with what you're saying yeah yeah it's, it's an interesting one um because i never thought of it that way it's just something i naturally do anyway when it comes to mixing i'm thinking right okay mm. well i'm going to go through and i'm just going to remove or attenuate frequencies that i don't necessarily need and it's great to hear that you're not automatically reaching for a high or low pass filter you're actually using the the um the shelves the low and high shelves um, which is a good thing to hear because sometimes that's all you need. You don't necessarily want to remove all that information. You just want to duck it down by three or four dB rather than get rid of it altogether. So it's good to hear that you're using those and not automatically going through all the uh, for the sort of high and low pass filtering. So that's a good yeah, thing. I, th I think I actually got that from you one year ago. <laughs> oh, amazing. That was, <laughs> yeah, that was something you mentioned to me that kind of stuck with me of like, you don't need to always um, high pass all the lows out. You can just low shelf it and just mm. leave a little bit of information there. Yeah, 100%. Because, again, conversations. This is the great thing about the podcast. I have conversations with all these other engineers, and they're like, yeah, that information, specifically in mastering, if it's not there, then like you can't boost what isn't there, essentially, if you want to. So, yeah, it's it's great. It's great that you're doing that. Um, so with regards to EQ, you, it sounds like you're doing the right things, and in particular with the presence frequencies in that mid-range, and you're using that to have your guitars cut through. Um, with regards to compression, now that's an interesting one because you're saying that at the moment you're compressing it as it's coming in, which is fine, which is fine. Um, but I think it'd be quite, that's where I guess if you were to record two signals, one that's not compressed and one that is, at least that way you've got the option then of tailoring that compression in the mix, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, no, I, I do notice like when it runs through the distortion pedal itself alone, I don't really have much out to compress anyway because like the whole thing is just one fat sausage and it's just like, you know, there, there is no such thing as dynamic after that. Because, okay, I, I'm going to expose myself on, 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 the, on the podcast. I don't know if this is controversial. I, I use a metal zone. <laughs> I metal zones are great. I used to use a metal zone back okay, that's uh, good. years and years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did use one. Many okay. the boss metal metal zone, right? It's black, isn't it? Yeah, if I remember sorry. rightly. Yeah, I've heard many things that it's been a very controversial figure in the guitar scene. So <laughs> I think it's one of those people say that there are there's there's certain equipment that when you mention it that it, you you meet it you're sort of like reluctant to say you have it there are or there are audio <laughs> interfaces that are like the common memes that you see online like the focus right oh, ones i've heard yes but, but ultimately <laughs> if it does the job you know then then use it like don't worry about what That's other true. people think you know just just go with it oh man i love boss pedals i used to have a quite an extensive collection of boss pedals i had the dd3 delay uh, i had the Ooh. ns2 noise gate um I had a few others as well. I can't remember the. Can't remember. I had the compressor, the Boss compressor pedal. I think it was like CP something or other. Um, and yeah, the Metal Zone for a while. And then I moved on. I got a PV um, six five zero five. So I didn't. I didn't need it anymore. Essentially. Um, I see. Still, it's still a great pedal though. But yeah, with compression, it sounds like if you're running it through that distortion, that distortion pedal is sort of like doing it already for you. It's kind of. Like, it sounds like it's limiting it for you as well at the same time by absolutely sort of slamming the signal that you've got going in there. Yeah, it's just like hard clipping everything, I mm, think. Mm. But if it works for your sound and it's the sound you want, then I don't see there's any, any problem with it, to be honest. But what I would say is I would definitely consider, like, if you're doing that, it's just recording a clean DI as well. I would certainly, mm, I would certainly do right. that. Um, and what, when, you're recording, when you're recording your guitars, are you just doing one 
guitar? Or are you doing like a left and right? Or are you or are you are you stacking? Are you doing two lefts and two rights? Um, yeah, I, I take like two takes, and then I uh, what do you call it? Double track. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I double track it. It's only two. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, we we only we only quadruple track. <laughs> I think I think that's the one because there were two guitarists. Essentially, that's the, that's oh. the reason why we did it. Um, but you don't ha- you don't have to. I mean, left and right we're fine. The EP I released last year, I just did left and right um, with oh. me playing, and it and it worked fine. One thing I was going to say to you, and this is quite a cool little trick you could try, is if you are you are double tracking your guitars, pan left and right, and then pan and then send the signal from each of those left and right guitars to uh, an auxiliary send with a compressor on it and then have like 8 to 10 ratio sort of like 10 20 db of uh, gain reduction on it and then have that compressor auxiliary send in the center and then just have that underneath the left and right guitars it's uh, it's quite a cool trick to do and it just means that your guitars sound louder without actually being louder if that makes sense in the sense of like it's one compressor that is being acted on, acted on by both signals but affecting both signals that's correct yeah so you, you, you've got your left and right and then you've got your auxiliary send with the compressor on it then you're sending the left and right signal the same amount to that compressor on that auxiliary send in the center and then you just bring that in underneath and it sort of like just tucks in underneath the left and right guitars and it just gives that sense of the guitars being fuller and louder without them, without you actually bringing up the volume of the left and right guitars. It's quite a cool little trick. Maybe one to try out. Would it be, because I'm imagining like, would it have that sort of thing where if the, let's say the left side is louder than the, li- the, the right side, would it bring the right side down too much or? Yeah, yeah you, you, you'd want the same amount of signal going from each of the guitars. So mm. you could put it in trying to think which way, way you would put it. You could have put it in pre-fade. Because your, is your left left guitar louder than the right guitar? Is that, no, is that what mean, you're saying? It's supposed to be the same, but because like sometimes I'll do like sort of like um, chuggy rhythms that are like somewhat not fully like the same. Like it's not always uh, like I see. chug, strum, chug, chug, strum. Maybe it's like yeah. I... I, I I might not perfectly do the chug in one and the other one sounds like louder kind of thing. They're like those minor inconsistencies. Yeah, I, th- I think that'd be fine. I, I, okay. I, yeah, that wouldn't, you wouldn't notice that too much because I think if you're using a sort of eight, 10 to one ratio on that, then it's going to have an impact on those transients. And, oh. it, and also because it's tucked in just underneath, it, it's not going to be audible yeah, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. I've never experienced it whereby it has had a detrimental effect on the other side, if that makes sense. Um, I think the best I thing so. would be to, is just to give it a try and see what it sounds like. But I've used it to great effect, and I, I think it sounds great. Um, I mean, obviously, if you were to have a left and right, and the left was ridiculously louder than the right, then it's then it's going to have a negative impact. But if it's just that like subtle variation in playing whereby it's just a touch louder here and there, then no, you, you're not going to notice that. Uh, right. I I think what I did for my latest um, upcoming release was that I had both sides going into a bus that just um, wave shaped it. I don't know if it gets a similar effect because I really enjoy using wave shaping. Um, okay. Uh, which I probably should learn to use compressors more. But um, so it all goes into one wave shaper, and then like I just I did this thing, which I don't know if it's a cardinal sin or not. Um, for each side of the guitar, I did reverse compression, where it would uh, boost the signal that was above a certain threshold. Oh, it's expansion. So you were using expansion on the guitars? Yeah, I guess. I Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. The, the idea was that I wanted to emphasize um, like certain like open strums compared to chugs. So that it would give a more rhythmic sound, especially when there was a lot of sh- stuff happening in the mix and it's not that easy to make the guitars out. And then having those run through a clipper so that the open strums would have almost like a different timbre to the chugs or like a, a more obvious difference in timbre. My first response would be like, if it sounds good, then do it. If, it, if, it, if you get the, if you get, if the effect that you get is what you want, then 
there is no rule in my in my head. I mean, yes, if you're using true. expansion to do that, and then you're running it through a clipper just to to trim those peaks, and you get the sound you want, and it is creatively changing the timbre of the instrument as well, then I would continue doing it. Uh, sounds like quite a cool trick, to be fair. Never considered it. I've never used an expand expansion or expander on the guitars. Um, but maybe it's something I'll, get, I'll, I'll have a look at going down in the future. There you go, audience. Give that one a go. I've never considered it. <laughs> I, I would, I would, you know, pay, place a disclaimer on it because I, 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 it is a thing where like I have to manually automate it to turn off whenever there are long chugs so that or long strum so that it doesn't yeah. just randomly dip down at some point in the strum. <laughs> right. Okay. So you got you got so, to control it. It sounds like it needs to be I, very much controlled. I guess so, yeah. yeah. But I, I guess you're right in the sense of there is always the golden rule of if it sounds cool, it sounds cool. Yeah, hundred percent. You can often I often find that if I am mixing something and then if I listen to it in isolation and I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. But then in the mix, I'm like, actually, it sounds quite good, and and it's, mm -hmm. it achieves the effect I want. And it might be a slightly um, unhinged way of of, <laughs> of achieving that effect. But if it works, like then then just do it and then just continue doing this it. This is true. Yeah, yeah. So that that was always the way I I've, I've been told, and that's kind of what I preach on the podcast as well. And uh, for the most part, it seems it seems it seems to work. Um, I re realise, Violet, we're coming towards the end of uh, this uh, producer kickstart. Um, so out of, we, out of what we've been through today, what sort of actionable steps do you think you'll take forward in your next project? Yeah, definitely the splitting. I'm gonna ha I'm gonna have to look into um, getting a splitter because I I I that's really never. Th been an idea in my head that I could do both at the same time um so I'm 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 definitely gonna give that a try I do I am curious about like the compression trick mm. uh it, it sounds like uh, I don't know if the right term is glue compressing yeah I suppose you could call it that in a, in a way because it is kind of it, well it's, it's definitely going to be gluing the two guitars together and right. putting them in the same space. I do something, some total tangent now, I do something similar with drums as well, whereby mm. I will have an auxiliary send with like um, the decapitator on it or some sort of saturation. And then what I'll do is I'll create, it's almost like a, a headphone mix for a recording artist. I will send a separate mix of the drums to that auxiliary send, not all the same level. So I'm mixing again into that auxiliary send. And then I'll use the decapitator on it just to add a bit of, for one of a better way of putting it, just punch and impact basically for drums. So it's not just guitars you can use that on that sort of trick on. I mean auxiliary sounds you can use on any instrument ultimately. Um, right. But again, you could switch out the compressor for something like a decapitator or saturation or distortion, because um, in a way they're kind of doing a similar thing. Now, that's a sweeping statement. I'll probably get corrected <laughs> on that. Um, but in a way, they are sort of like slamming down on that signal and then affecting right. that signal. So you could try it. You could try compressors, saturation, distortion, other tips, the wave, wave shaper element that you you mentioned there as well. But that's cool. The splitter will be good. It'd be interesting to see. Um, l let me know how that goes when you, if you, if and when you do implement it and, and oh, how yeah, you get for on. Sure. Um, so uh, give yourself a bit of a shout out now. Where can our audience find you online? Where's the best place to go? And also, have you got any key dates, any releases coming up as well? Oh, well, I'm so glad you asked. Um, so uh, you can find all my links at linktree slash VYLT music. No caps, no spaces. Um, you can find me on Instagram at VYLT underscore music. That's where I think I'm most um, active. Uh, I I think my uh, most upcoming thing is going to be on the 23rd of March. So it's not too far off. Cool. Um, it is a remix of a track done by Falling Islands. I, I'm not sure if you're familiar. No, no. He's, Tell me more. He's a really, really uh, talented producer from Singapore as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, like, we're in the same because I'm in my university's electronic club it's called electronic music lab and so falling islands he's a an assistant tutor at that club so yeah we we i got a chance to work with him for a remix of one of his tracks um manifesto so it's from his net walker ep and it's gonna be the he's releasing a whole remix ep of everything from that e from that ep like remixed by really cool singaporean artists coming out on the 23rd of March. 
So I'm Amazing. very excited. Yeah, I'm Fantastic so excited stuff. for that. Yeah. I I will put links to your link tree and also that track as well because this episode is going to go out post that release date. So audience oh, listening, great. you'll be able to click on the link in the episode description. And not only um, follow VYLT, Violet Online, but also check out that remix as well. Um, so do go and do that. And uh, before you go, folks, if you want to be like my friend here, uh, VYLT, and become a producer Kickstart participant, just click on the link in the episode description, or you can go to the website insidethemixpodcast.podia.com, which will soon be changed into insidethemixpodcast.com because I have bought the domain for that and I need to set the website up. And uh, so, yes, get signed up and join me on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you uh, almost a year to the day that we last spoke, which is amazing. Um, So, yes, Violet, good luck with the release and also mixing guitars as well. And I will catch up with you soon.